And even this game is really odd. Oh, I didn't notice you there. Ah, you know how this goes by now. This is actually my two year anniversary episode. That's right, two years on a YouTube. So of course, I have to look at an Odd World game. And the next game on my list to tackle is the second game of the Quintology, Odd World Munch's Odyssey. So let's see if this game is worth it. If you've watched the first two parts of my Oddworld reviews, I have gone over a brief history of the games and the company that made them. Needless to say, the Oddworld games were very popular at their time and they were critically acclaimed and made Abe a star. There was always a grand plan for these games as well, to tell the story of the world of Mudos and the inhabitants of it, with there being five different main characters in the Quintology. The first one was Abe, and this is the second part of the Quintology, even though it's the third game, don't question it, don't worry about it, which stars Munch. Munch's Odyssey was released in 2001, which means Lorne Lanning lied to us. <laughs> anyway, we start with a heartbreaking scene of seeing Munch with his fellow Gabbits swimming and being happy before they are all captured, and Munch seems to be the only one left. That is until he hears one on land. Curious, he goes to investigate only to be captured by the Vickers, who look absolutely ugly but awesome. <laughs> they run some tests on Munch and fit him with a sonar device in his head so they could use Use him to collect their traps. This backfires, however, because he makes friends with the Fuzzles and lets them out of their traps, and they are absolutely vicious. They free Munch, and now he must escape. Meanwhile, our beloved Abe is sent on a quest from the almighty Raisin, that's really his name, who says that he will need the help of Munch if he wants to free some more Mudarkins from captivity and slavery, and that he can help Munch out on his quest as well. Whatever happens, I can't wait to play Abe and Munch's fun adventures. It is no secret that I absolutely love the Oddworld games. I own them on practically every platform that they've ever come out on, like PS1, Steam, PlayStation 3, the Xbox, just anything. I even own some stuffed toys of them, which are incredibly cute. By the way, I absolutely love these guys and I couldn't wait to show them off. But regardless, I love the story, the world, and the characters that are all in this game. And I was so excited to play it until I found out that it was going to come out on the Xbox. This game was supposed to come out on the PlayStation 2 in the year 2000, but then Lorne Lanning learnt of a new system that was coming out that was going to be more powerful the Xbox, and so struck a deal with Microsoft. The problem being is that Microsoft dicked them around a little bit. Now there's not a whole lot of information on the internet, but basically it went like Microsoft kept putting in their own ideas and trying to make the game less dark and more kid friendly, but Lord Lanning wanted to keep it dark and keep it less kid friendly, and they were always butting heads. Because of this there were scheduling conflicts, there were delays, and then there was things that had to be cut from the game, etc, etc. There's so much of this game that was just left on the cutting room floor because of these decisions. Now, because this game came out on the Xbox, I didn't get to play it when I was younger. I did, uh, didn't own an Xbox growing up, but I do own one now because I'm crazy and own everything. But I did get to play the game a little bit in the demos when they had it at the like local shopping center. So I did get to experience this game and oh gosh, I was so excited for it because I really enjoyed Odyssey. I really Really enjoyed Abe's Exodus and I couldn't wait to get to this game. My biggest issue was is that it uh, had drastically changed. The first two games are in 2D and as you'll see they went to the new dimension. They went to 3D and I was still getting into 3D gaming and I wasn't very good at it so I wasn't very good at the demo of this game either. But that's enough about my history. Let's dive into the game itself. In this game, you play as both Munch and Abe, and they both control in a fairly similar way, moving and jumping around, and they both have game speak, but they both are unique in what they can do. Abe is much better on land and easier to control with a high cartoony jump and the ability to pick up and throw objects. He can also chant to possess bad guys, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. One thing he can't do though is swim, and thus dies if he even touches more than a puddle. Munch can be frustrating to run around, or should I say hop around? 
sound because he is a fish and that walking sound that he has oh my god does it get on my nerves but when he is swimming, he moves quite fast, he can jump pretty high out of the water. He can also activate machines for you to use like the crane. But oh dear lord, the Xbox controls are absolutely dreadful. The right stick click is melee. The camera is awkward because it uses the D-pad. And to talk, you press the button once to do the first talking action, and you do the second talking action by holding that button down. It is awkward and horrible, and it's one of those what were they thinking kind of thing. But what will you be doing in this game? Well, this game is broken up into levels, and each of them has some kind of goal, with most of them just trying to access the exit and save all of the scrubs and fuzzles along the way. In the second half of the game, there is an added plot point where you are trying to make Lulu the Glucken rich so they can use him for their own purposes. This means that you have to find one or more Gluckens in the stage and get them to give up all of their moolah. Honestly, from the outset the game has a lot of similarities and ideas with the first two games, but it's all handled very differently. Essentially, you'll be running around all of the levels trying to find the exit as well as trying to save all of the things along the way and solving puzzles, of course. Now, the puzzles in this game are a little weak to say the least. One of the puzzles are as follows. As Munch, you will control a crane, so you have to pick up all the different people and then either throw them into a section where they can die, or maybe even drop bombs onto them. And then they all are gone from the room. Then you have to switch to Abe. Abe runs into the room and stops. You switch back to Munch. Now Munch picks up Abe and drops him in a spot where there is a lever that he couldn't jump to. Then you have to switch back to Abe. You pull the lever which opens the door to the next area. And then as Abe, you run into the next area. That's a puzzle. I do not call that a puzzle. Now, the very first time I did this, I wasn't too upset about it. It was fine enough, but this puzzle is repeated multiple times throughout the game, and it doesn't change either. Sometimes you'll be picking up the enemies and putting them in a spot where they will die. Sometimes you'll be dropping the bombs on them. That is the only change. It is not a puzzle in the slightest, but this game makes it out to be. The puzzles are bad, and the level design doesn't help either. Most of the levels are barren and boring. Now the textures and the look of the water is fine, actually a little impressive for the time that it came out, but there is barely anything in the levels. When I think of Oddworld, I think about the lovable characters and the unique locations. I can remember so many places from the first two games, from Rupture Farms, the Stockyards, the Temples, to Necrom Mines, Soulstorm Brewery, and the Sleek Barracks. Here, everything kinda looks the same. We have outside areas that look green sometimes, with native buildings, and then other times they have factory buildings. That's the only difference. Then we have the insides of these factories, which do have some different textures, but honestly, I can't tell the difference between one level or another because they all practically look the same. I have no idea why they did this to the game. I was so looking forward to exploring the world that I had seen in the first two games, but in 3D. But what we got just wasn't good. One thing that they did get right are the characters. They are both lovable and goofy. Munch as the brand new protagonist is so cute and so lonely and he's also so fun. He has a bit of a strange accent and it's a bit hard to understand what he's saying at times but honestly I really enjoyed him as a main character. Abe as well has come back and he's just the same as what he was in the first two games, albeit he has a little bit less to say, so he's a little bit less goofy, but that doesn't mean he doesn't get himself into some sticky situations, which we get to see in the cutscenes. Every one of these cutscenes has so much humour to them, from the slapstick humour of people hitting each other to the well-written humour of just the dialogue given. I love absolutely every one of them, they are that good. And they also help to get the relationship between our two main characters. as they they meet, they are becoming forced friends, like they have to help each other to work out what they're doing, but they're not really super friends. As the game goes on, they actually do become friends. Oh, isn't that cute? Uh, so by the end, even though it's a little rushed and handled not the best, you do feel the friendship and camaraderie between these two as the game goes on, which I enjoy. There's also a lot of lines and dialogue set in the game itself. Now these guys have lots of things to say to each other and to other natives around that it's fun enough that you hear the first time, but there aren't too many different sound samples, so you'll be hearing the same things often enough. But 
it's it's fine it didn't get too grating honestly now i think i've done an all right job at showing you most of the game in a nutshell but from here on out it's going to be more of a rant this game let me down on so many levels and it's all due to the fact that i have the first two games to compare this to let's start with my biggest problem of the game the focus this game is called Munch's Odyssey, but honestly, Munch is just a side character in this game. The game has you using Munch at the start before he teams up with Abe, and from there you'll be using Abe for about 90% of the game. Abe is faster and can get to more areas, so you'll want to use him over the slow and awkward Munch. A lot of the levels had me going through exploring with Abe and getting as much done as I can before I hit some kind of water or a machine that only Munch can use. Then I would switch to Munch, use him for a little bit by slowly walking him over to the area that he needs to be, and then pretty much opening the way for Abe. Then I would switch back to Abe and continue playing until I was forced to use Munch again. Honestly, so little time is spent with the title character that I just found it absurd. It is also stated at the start that you will need to save the fuzzles with Munch, but out of the 310 things that you need to save, less than a third of those are fuzzles. They are barely in the game. The main focus in this game is on Abe, and I think this is due to his popularity. He is the face of Oddworld, which makes sense, but I would have liked to have a lot less of him in this game. Keep him as a cameo near the start, and if they really wanted him to team up with Munch, then have it happen later in the game after Munch has had a chance to shine and be the hero that the game is making him out to be. Oh wow, I can't believe silly old Munch is getting his own Oddworld video game. Did somebody say Oddworld? Oh, it's Abe. Hey Abe, I was just doing my own Oddworld video game. Yeah. Ah! Well, I'm the star, so I should be the lead in the game. Then we have the gameplay. It's absolutely boring. Because all of these levels look so similar and they're just so barren, there isn't a lot to see and do. So you'll just be running from one spot to another. Because these levels also don't have a lot to do in them and the puzzles themselves are just idiotic, you won't feel a sense of accomplishment as you go through these levels. Sure, sometimes getting through a tricky situation or getting the scrubs or the fuzzles to the bird portal to save them can feel rewarding but that is few and far between. Over the course of the entire game, you don't learn too many new things and you don't get to possess very new things either. So the gameplay is fairly similar from start to finish. And because of that, after you finish the first couple of levels, it's just boring from then on out. For some reason, Oddworld inhabitants decided to put very short walls into some of these levels, and it just baffles me why they did this. So at one point, you will have to have a bunch of Mudarkins following you, and then you get to a very short wall. Then you have to pick up each Mudarkin one at a time and throw them over the wall one at a time. It is slow, boring, tedious, and useless. It's just a kind of padding. Now, some of these walls make sense as they can block enemies from reaching certain areas, as well as a higher wall that Munch can't get over. But having it in the way that you just have to throw people over in order to get to the door that they're going to open is just bafflingly stupid, in my opinion. It just makes the game feel that little bit longer, but it isn't a fun way of doing anything. Because of this, the game felt like a chore to finish. I was not sucked into the world, the puzzles weren't challenging enough, and most of the levels were just boring to play through and to look at, so I didn't really want to keep playing, but I forced myself to in order to finish the game. One thing that was done right are the new enemies and variations of them, as well as changing up the old enemies as well. For the most part, you'll be dealing with sligs and slogs from the first game, turning up near the start, and the very new vicars as well. Funny enough though, two of the old staples, paramites and scrabs, are barely seen and aren't even used effectively. From being such a big part of the first games, they are just kind of there in this game. They don't really do much except chase after you, and there isn't any real puzzle around them other than just running away, which isn't a bad thing, I just wish that there was more. And that's the thing though, when this game was going to come out, Microsoft gave them a hard date to make this game by because they wanted it to be a launch title. These time constraints and making the game in 3D, which is 100% different from the first game, meant that Oddworld Inhabitants had so much work to do and not a lot of time to do it in. 
Much of the game was cut from content, story elements, levels, and characters, which is why this feels incomplete. I think if the team had more time to work on this game and made it the way that they wanted to, then it would have been a lot better than the game that we got. Some of the other puzzles that you'll be doing in this game have you using the various vending machines that are strewn about all of Oddworld. These offer temporary powers that you have to use effectively before they run out. These powers include going invisible, jumping higher, uh, giving you a, uh, a faster run so you can you know, get past all the enemies really quickly, as well as giving Munch uh, a zap attack so we can hurt people and it's quite effective. That's pretty cool, it's one of the best vending machines out there. Now because because of this, there is a much heavier focus on the attacking side and the fighting side and the battle side of this game. As you'll be playing through it, both Abe and Munch have their own different attacks uh, where Munch with the vending machine and Abe can bitch slap people, which is always fun. But you'll also be talking to the native Mudakins and the Fuzzles and you have a new command which is unique to this game called Attack. No longer do you just have a one hit death like in the first two games, but now you have a health bar. So a stray bullet that hits you doesn't instantly kill you, or accidentally touching water with Abe doesn't instantly kill you, which I think is fantastic. Also the enemies have life as well, so you'll be using uh, your guys to fight them. There's a little bit of strategy to this, so you'll be sending out your people and trying to get them to attack, and as you play through the game you unlock three different tiers of attackers, one which is just using their hands to hit them, the second one which is the tomahawk guys which uses giant clubs, and the best which are the mud archers which have like a, a really cool gun that they can shoot the bad guys from afar with, and then the fuzzles which are just vicious and they don't have any kind of upgrades to them. This opens a little bit of strategy in the game, where you could run in with your guys and just try and kill all the hordes as you see them, or you could try and lure the people away one at a time and get your guys to pick them off. Because of this, you have a few different options which is welcome, but chances are some of you guys will die. But it's not the end of the world though, because most of the levels have a way to revive your characters, but doing so does affect your Kwama. And what is Kwama, you might ask? That's the good or bad rating in this game. By saving Madakins and Fuzzles and keeping the natives alive, you get positive Kwama, and by killing them or not freeing them, dips it to negative, which affects the ending just like the first two games. There are two proper ending cutscenes with four different newspapers at the end, depending on your final Kwama, all of which are fun and dark. So if you're anything like me, you'll want to keep everybody alive for the very best ending, and you won't want to use them in battle as you will fear for their death. But this game has a broken mechanic, that if one of your duo dies, the other can revive them by touching certain eggs. You don't have any penalty for this other than wasting time. Bad guys don't regenerate health so you can wear them down, bitch slapping them until they die. You don't lose any Kwama either. It's more boring to run in and do it yourself, die, and then have to run all the way back and try again. In the first two games, if you made a mistake, it would cost you your life, and you'd have to try the puzzle again. Here, just keep hitting them until they die, no matter how long it takes. This takes away the tension and the threat to anything in the game, because you usually can just deal with it, albeit slowly. Towards the end of the game, there is a part where you have to kill a lot of Vickers with Munch, one of the few times you get to use him. <laughs> and to say that it's tough is an understatement. There are so many of these guys, and they also have guns that shoot you, and chances are you will die. After Abe revives you, you have to do the long walk back, and it's boring, only to get another chance to try and shock them a few more times. I died here quite a lot before I abused the quick save option, actually. It was a chore, it just wasn't fun at all. It sure is fun being part of my own game. Just fun standing here. Oh look, Abe needs my help. Can, can I come too now? What? No. There's no water yet. Okay. 
Due to this lack of threat, most of the time I just had Munch standing by where the egg spawn would be and then have Abe run off and do whatever he wanted, you know, exploring the place and taking down the bad guys. If he was to die, Munch would just revive him and then I have to do the boring trek back to where I was before I died and then continue. There is no threat to this game and it's such a shame because of this mechanic. There's also a few run levels in this game where you have to run from the beginning to the end as well as being chased by all like the paramites, the scrabs, sligs and all that kind of stuff and those can be a little bit more fun but they too are a little bit broken because you will just be running, running, running. If you make a mistake then you just die and you know the other person Munch or Abe will just revive you and you get to try again. Take this back to the first two games where you had the Paramite run and the Scrab run from a Abe's Exodus. Those two were absolutely amazing. I can still remember the Paramite run and how crazy it is when it's all dipped in shadow and you can't see where you're going and you have to run through this gauntlet of paramites like falling down from the ceiling coming out of the walls it is so horrifying and fun and it's also quite memorable because it's one of the few action sequences in the game and in this game in that game, sorry, you have to do it all by memorization. You have to remember each of the uh, times you have to roll, the times you have to jump, and where the bad guys will spawn. If you make a mistake, you get sent back to the beginning and you have to do the whole thing again. But like I said, in these new run ones, you don't have that kind of threat. If you make a mistake, just try again. There's no cause to alarm. There's nothing. Sometimes a person that you might be carrying will die, and that's a shame, so you have to reload your save if you're going for the 100% ending. But that is only the smallest of threats in this game. I just can't get across how underwhelming it feels because you have no sense of threat if you die it's no big deal and be there's no like if both characters die at the same time then it's a big deal when both characters die you get sent back to the beginning of the level and you have to do the whole thing again but chances are these will be few and far between because most of the time Munch or Abe will be left in a safe place whilst the other character is doing whatever they're doing. So the chances of you dying full, full dying is slim. And because of that, there's, like I said, there's no threat. Oh, it's just... It's just bad. It's just bad. Even though there's a lot of enemies throughout the game, you'll be using your buddies to try and kill them, or maybe you'll be using Munch's head blast, you know, or Abe's bitch slap to kill them, or Abe's possession. And let's just talk about that possession a little bit, shall we? When Abe chants, he no longer just possesses the nearest bad guy, and I fully understand this change. There is no target or lock-on feature, so you may get someone that you didn't want to possess, and then you'd have to figure out range and all of that stuff. Instead, when you chant, you create a possession orb that you can move around, and if it touches a bad guy, then you are in control of him. Mostly you do this just so you can kill them and the other bad guys that are around them. There is one game speak moment with a bad guy, just one, and it honestly sucks. But they also put another limitation on your orb as well. You need spoose. Spoose is dumb. All around the game, you'll be finding these green little blobs called spoose, and collecting them is required to open doors and to resurrect your fallen allies. It's a forced limitation, so Abe isn't all powerful, and so they can put doors in the way to close certain areas. Spoose is everywhere though, and the hit detection for it can be a little bit iffy at times, where I'm sure I touched it, but it doesn't actually collect. But what is even dumber is that Abe can regrow them and have an endless supply. Sure, it's boring and it takes forever to get up to the higher numbers, but you can do it, so what's the point of having it everywhere? They should have used it more effectively, or just got rid of it. Honestly, the game doesn't need them. If they wanted to limit the chant more, then just add more anti-chant things around, or maybe Abe creates the orb and it's one size and it has a certain distance it can go before it goes poof. That way you can have the chant, but it's not overpowered. Lastly, as a very quick peeve, there is no Shrikel anywhere. When two games had it be this amazing thing that Abe could do, here it's not even mentioned. I would have thought that saving so many scrubs will let him use it near the end, but nope, let's just forget about his godly power, shall we? Also, there was a HD remake that has been released which fixed some of the problems that I 
I had with the game. They updated the controls so attack is its own button and game speak is like the old games where you hold down a trigger before you press a face button. Also being HD, the graphics have been updated which makes things look nicer, especially Ave and Munch. It also added some trophies that have some glitches which is annoying, but overall it's the best way to experience the game if you wish to do so. In my opinion, Oddworld Munch's Odyssey is not worth it and it's such a shame because the first two games in the series were incredible but this game just lacks everything the gameplay is boring the levels are lackluster there's no differentiating between any of the levels if you showed me any one level in the game I'd be like no no idea where it could be it's such a badly made game and I think it's due to the fact that Microsoft had all these deadlines and limitations to the game and because they had this giant grand idea that they had to make within a small period of time. Now this game does have some good points. Uh, Abe and Munch are great and I really enjoy the characterization of the two. The cutscenes are brilliant just like in the first games. Uh, the score and the music for the games is really top notch. I didn't really get to talk about it much but still it's really really good. Um, but it's just not enough to warrant a playthrough of this game. In my humble opinion, you should just watch all of the cutscenes on YouTube and that will be all you need to get out of this game, honestly, because playing through it is a chore and I don't like doing chores, nobody does, so I don't recommend this game. So tell me what you guys thought about Oddworld Munch's Odyssey. When I was doing my research into this game, I found that a lot of people had a lot of complaints very similar to mine in terms of controls and lackluster puzzles and just boring elements to the game. But even though they would give it all this negative feedback, they would still give it like a 4 out of 5. And I just didn't understand that. I really think it has to do with the fact that it hits so many nostalgia points because of the fact that the first two games were still fairly fresh in everyone's memory. Honestly, this game could have been so much more if Microsoft didn't dick it around. But um, maybe this is your favorite uh, game in the series. Maybe I missed something and you guys can tell me what it is, but honestly, I just did not have fun playing through this game. Though the ending was still incredible, so I'm glad that I finished it. I'm just not glad that I played it. So don't forget to like and subscribe and, you know, comment below, do all that kind of stuff. And I'll see you guys next year for another Odd World game. Hopefully the next one in the Quintology, but I know for a fact that it's not going to be. So whatever, I'll pick some kind of Odd World game. You'll see. Bye. Oh, no, Munch. <laughs>